Good to get back. Thank you. Uh, we know that Alberta has been dominating the corporate renewables purchasing space, uh, but what are the possibilities in other jurisdictions? And we have expert speakers who will walk us uh, through that today. And we will also announce a new goal for BRC Canada. So that's all very exciting for us. But before we go that there, uh, I'd like to spend a moment on land acknowledgement. Um, BRC Canada is a national initiative. Uh, we operate ma mainly here on Treaty 7 land in Calgary uh, with some team members on Treaty 6. And I want to say that a land acknowledgement is a small step in the work we all do towards reconciliation. Um, today, we have a lot of exciting things to cover in the context of expanding the ambition, expanding renewables, and powering our operations and homes with electricity that is zero emission. At the same time, what is beyond the megawatts that we produce? What is the people aspect of the work, especially when we consider that our energy system in Canada was built with zero input from the Indigenous peoples, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples. And for that, here at BRC Canada, we're very focused on call to action number 92, uh, that is on economic reconciliation. We want to see more direct participation of Indigenous peoples in the renewable energy projects. Uh, we want to see more engagement of corporate Canada in economic reconciliation, uh, and not only in Alberta, but potentially in other provinces as we expand these ambitions. And what I'm personally learning is that this work is really hard. Um, the path to truth and reconciliation is a continuous journey. It doesn't end by me doing a land acknowledgement or taking a course or finishing a project. Um, and with that, and in the spirit of reconciliation, I invite you all to consider what is your role and within your spaces of power and privilege to advance reconciliation in our country. I feel really privileged to be a guest on Treaty 7, and I'd like to acknowledge that we live in this special place, uh, the traditional territories of the peoples of the Treaty 7 region in southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot First Nation tribes of Siksika, uh, the Bigani, the Gaina, the Tsutina First Nation, and the Stony Nakoda First Nation tribes of Chiniki, Berspa, and Wesley. Thank you for listening. Um, I'll move to the agenda. Um, and it's always um, a bit of an aggressive switch from the land acknowledgement to the agenda. Uh, we, I'll continue with doing a, an introduction on BRC Canada. Uh, following that, we'll do an Alberta market overview and why Alberta has been dominating this market. Uh, we'll announce our goal. And then we'll kick off our panel, our esteemed panelists that come from uh, the government of Canada, the government of Nova Scotia, and two expert speakers uh, touching on Ontario and Saskatchewan today. Next, please. Special thank you to our event sponsors in 2022. Uh, this is EDF Renewables and Res Group. Uh, both companies are founding companies of BRC Canada, and they also sit as advisors on our advisory board. So thank you for your support. Next. So uh, why do we exist as BRC Canada? Uh, basically, we're focused on simplifying and accelerating large-scale renewable energy use across Canada through power purchase agreements. And we do this through education, 
Uh, we develop internal capacity uh, within organizations and different teams, uh, raising awareness even uh, in the media and supporting that narrative. Uh, we also provide support throughout the procurement journey within companies and institutions and municipalities. Uh, we offer cost-effective tools, services, and training programs uh, for all your teams, whether they are from finance, procurement, legal, um, and your executive team as well if they have questions. So lots of uh, resources once you are part of the BRC community. <clears throat> So the, I've mentioned the PPA market is uh, has shown has shown a big growth, especially in last year. Uh, it is right now at a three point seven five billion dollars worth of renewables construction uh, by twenty twenty three, and forty five hundred jobs will come with that. Uh, when we launched as VRC Canada back in 2019, uh, we launched with a two gigawatt by 2025 goal, but we already crushed it in May this year, three years ahead of schedule. And that's why we have a new goal, which we'll announce shortly. Uh, next, please. Uh, this is the BRC community, and these are the leading organizations that continue to lead the work in the PPA market. Um, and I'm proud to say that 90% of the deals that we've seen are led by these organizations. It includes one of these buyers or one of these developers or one of these intermediaries, and sometimes all of them together in one deal or two. Uh, so it's very exciting for us to see that growth and evolution. So our model, we have the renewable energy buyers, we have the, re the renewable energy developers and the intermediaries, uh, and uh, you can join us. Uh, if you're interested, please email us. Uh, and we also have a non-for-profit rate if uh, this is something you would be interested in. So today's speakers, uh, we have really a number of experts and I'm, in, I'm very excited to learn from all of you today. Uh, we have Stephen Cookson from Res Group uh, who will provide the overview on Alberta. We have Jason Chialoy from Power Advisory and he will uh, touch on the Ontario market. Uh, Leanne Thurber from the government of Nova Scotia uh, is the lead analyst uh, for the Green Choice Program, uh, and she will tell us more about that program. Uh, Maxime Sandini uh, with the government of Canada, uh, who will speak on the um, Clean Electricity Initiative and the motivation behind the procurement that they're doing. And Ben Thibault, uh, he is a, a regulatory expert. He will be our moderator for the panel today. Next, please. So uh, without further ado, I'll pass it to Stephen, Director of Development and Origination at RES. Uh, he's also a, a board uh, advisor with BRC Canada. How about I turn it to you, Stephen? Thanks, uh, Najwan. Uh, hello, everyone. Am I coming through OK? Great. Um, well, really, uh, really pleased and honored to be given this opportunity to share a little bit of my uh, our experience, I guess, at, at RES with regards to the uh, what we call the the CNI, um, so uh, commercial and industrial, but some folks call it corporate uh, PPA market in Alberta, which is I used to say was a, an emerging market, but it feels like it's quite a well-established, uh, well-established uh, market uh, today. Um, so I'm looking forward to hearing uh, <clears throat> uh, some uh, some discussion from the other from the other panelists today. Uh, Najwan and, and BRC asked uh, um, asked us uh, asked me at, at RES here to discuss a little bit about the Alberta market, its its history uh, to date. Um, what has worked and perhaps what has worked uh, a, a little bit less in terms of uh, getting uh, the new re renewables projects uh, to market. And I believe the intent is to have this uh, uh, this panel and 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 uh, the participants in the in this in the seminar here uh, can to consider the possible pathways that we can replicate this this success we've seen in, in the Alberta market and in other jurisdictions across uh, across across Canada. So I'll try to focus my discussion uh, or my my short present 
presentation here on 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 that. Um, I think we'll probably have some time for for questions at at, at the end. Um, unfortunately, I, I I as I mentioned to the panelists uh, earlier, unfortunately I won't be able to stay for the full segment. We've got a board board meeting coming up um, uh, short shortly here, but I, I am able to um, uh, comment on the market, and then I'll be handing off uh, the the microphone. Uh, for res to my colleague uh, Matt Matt Whiteman, who's in our origination group at, uh, here, and uh, who'll hopefully be able to join in the panel panel discussion with Jason and and, and the gang. So maybe we can uh, go off to our next uh, our next slide. So well, I'm often asked why, uh, and I, I don't want to make this too basic, but I I, I do want to provide the some of the fundamentals here. But I'm often asked why the, there's we only see uh, CNI projects or corporate PPA projects occurring in the in the Alberta market, and um, the main reason is because it's a uh, it's because of liquid, liquid open market. Um, so an open IPP market, um, which which allows for for generators um, and electricity purchasers to uh, establish bilateral contracts and and purchase electricity and environmental attributes through. Um, uh, through the ASO system using uh, a simple contract for, for, for differences. Um, that mechanism that I just mentioned, contract for differences, is the, is the mechanism uh, that allows us to do these uh, long-term VPPAs, virtual power purchase agreements, so which we sometimes refer to as, as, uh, as, as off-take agreements. And I guess, these types of agreements are are very commonplace in the in, in, in the electricity markets across across Canada. Uh, traditionally, they've been used by Crown utilities um, in Ontario and Quebec and, and across across Canada and the Maritimes. Um, most recently in, in Saskatchewan, uh, by the Crown utility or the uh, provincial grid operator uh, to roll out. Um, government mandated procurements uh, for uh, wind or solar energy and all sorts of uh, generation types as, 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 as well. The most recent example in Alberta were the ASO uh, RFPs that occurred uh, several years ago. At the base of those um, uh, at the base of those procurements, those RFPs was a simple contract for different structure where uh, the ASO was um, Procuring electricity on a long-term basis and settling the price of that electricity between an established strike price and um, the market price of the day and of the hour that the electricity was 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 generated. So the the CNI market or the or the corporate renewable offtake market is is basically just an extension of that, but where the actors are private IPPs uh, and um, and corporations who are looking to uh, fix their electricity costs and procure environmental attributes for um, a certain a certain uh, term. So uh, the slide here uh, refers to uh, re retail choice, uh, which I think I just descri described, and and the spot market price, um, uh, which is um, which is what we settle the CFDs on. So uh, I'll pause. I'll pause there. Uh, Najwan, I don't know if you wanted me to go a little bit more into detail, but I'd, I'd like to, if not, I'd like to get, get going on some of the other uh, main um, developments we've been seeing in the, in the Alberta market. So it, it's a quick overview, so we can go to the next slide. Yeah. Perfect. Um, so these are the different kind of types of uh, contracts that we, that, that we see. Um, associated with these with these offtake agreements um, in in different markets. So uh, in some cases, we've seen uh, companies decide to do on-site on-site solar, so co-located or behind the fence solar solar projects um, uh, at their at their facility and behind their substation. Um, in some cases, we've seen offtakers or corporations uh, interested in 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 the renewable energy. Uh, credit or certificate um, uh, pursue simple purchases of what we call unbundled RECs. So uh, RECs that are available on in, in, in the market, surplus RECs from projects or, uh, or contracted uh, REC procurements. 
um, that don't involve the purchase of, of the bundled electricity. Um, in some markets, uh, particularly, particularly in, in, in the US, we've seen this across many, many states, uh, we've seen green tariff programs. And so this is a program, um, a type of program where, where, the, where the utility will procure a certain volume of renewable electricity and then turn around and sell that uh, electricity at, at specific rates under specific conditions to its to its client client base. And there's certain versions of those green tariffs that um, uh, that work uh, like uh, sleeved PPAs. And so I think we'll be getting into that a, a little bit later. And finally, the 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 virtual PPA, the VPPA, which, which we've seen many deals done uh, as, as summarized by, by Najwan's uh, deal tracker slide there. So simple description of the, of the VPPA here. Uh, I've, already I've already described it. Um, generally, we see um, in Alberta, off takers uh, not only interested in the RECs, but uh, interested in the regulated, um, conversion of the environmental attribute. So um, not just perhaps producing RECs, which could be Eco's, Eco Logo certified RECs or Green E certified RECs, but, but um, uh, regulated carbon offsets under the, under the tier, tier program and the value of those uh, offsets and environmental attributes uh, form a, a, a significant basis of the, of, of the, reg, of the revenue streams that are supporting these financial closes. Uh, the, other, the other element that supports the financial closes are the, are the long, longer term contracts. So I think we've all, we all have in, on the development side and sometimes even on the, on the buyer side, we've all got our, our version of this, this slide. Uh, and it's, it's just an attempt to, to, to describe the, the flow of um, electricity, environmental attributes, and the set settling mechanism that are that are used between the between the players, um, and obviously we we depend on uh, the the market, the liquid market, um, to settle to settle these contracts and 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 provide uh, stability to these transactions. So we talked talked a bit about uh, 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 Rex. Um, so certainly benefit, uh, that's a potential benefit of the, of, of the VPPA, the virtual power purchase agreement is, is, is the buyer's ability to procure RECs. But again, those really what they're procuring in most cases are environmental attributes. And so the attribute of the megawatt hour of electricity that's generated, uh, that could then be claimed under either voluntary or regulated programs. So we, we at Reds like to talk about the, the sale of environmental attributes, and, and then it's up to the buyer and the seller whether or not those are converted into RECs or into carbon offsets or, or, or what, whatnot. Um, some basics from the, from the BRC primer, and I, I, I encourage uh, uh, participants here to go to the uh, BRC webpage. There's a bunch of great primers that describe what the environmental attributes are and the various uh, various pathways that we can take to uh, uh, generate either either rex or carbon uh, carbon offset. So I touched on this uh, a little bit um, on the on the, on the previous slide, but thanks Najwan or Calvin for 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 flipping ahead here because uh, this slide is really what kind of describes those two pathways that I uh, that I that that I mentioned. Now of significant interest to participants in the seminar from other provinces is to perhaps really try to understand what the, the, the valuation um, mechanisms and, and, and monetization pathways and real value is in environmental attributes created in, in their province. You know, for example, in Quebec, uh, we, we wouldn't be able to produce much of a carbon offset because our, our, our grid is 97% uh, renewable. Uh, and so we wouldn't be able to displace um, grid emissions like we can in Alberta and generate carbon uh, car carbon offsets. And so obviously there's uh, different provinces, different regulatory uh, systems, different emission grid or supply mix emission intensities across Canada. And so 
uh, those will go a long way to understanding whether or not there, there are viable um, DQTA markets uh, uh, in a particular jurisdiction. Wonderful. So that's, I think, all I had, Najwan. Uh, I want. I hope that was helpful and um, happy to, to take any questions or, or if folks uh, uh, want to contact me after uh, the presentation, feel free to reach out to me. I think uh, Calvin's going to flash up my contact information. Thank you so much, Stephen. That was a great overview of the Alberta opportunity. Uh, and clearly, just to quickly summarize, companies are the driver force behind PPAs here in Alberta. And they're doing that because they have strong ESG commitments they're trying to deliver on specifically, specifically for scope to emissions. And the second reason, they're hedging, they're saving uh, in these long-term contracts by locking in competitive power prices. Uh, so these are the drivers for the PPA market. And of course, it's facilitated by Alberta's deregulated uh, market. I'm going to move us to our new goal at BRC Canada, some drum uh, roll moment in here. Uh, we have been very excited about this, just really achieving our, uh, our initial goal of two gigawatts by 2025. Uh, let's watch a quick video that will summarize uh, our goal. When the Business Renewable Centre Canada was founded in 2019, Two gigawatts of renewable energy deals by 2025 felt like an ambitious goal. As of May 2022, we have hit that goal, almost three years ahead of schedule. So, what's next? BRC Canada is expanding our ambition with a new goal of 10 gigawatts of renewable energy deals by 2030. Those first two gigawatts of wind and solar were all in Alberta. But to hit 10 gigawatts, we're going to need to go beyond. We'll need to make it possible for corporations and institutions to buy renewable energy in other provinces with carbon emitting grids. Two gigawatts of solar and wind in Alberta is driving $3.75 billion of investment, 4,500 jobs by 2023, and enough energy to power over 640,000 homes. Just imagine what 10 gigawatts will do. And beyond the megawatts, there's an opportunity to advance reconciliation with Indigenous peoples through direct participation in these projects. Join us as we move Canada closer to achieving its commitment to a net zero electricity grid by 2035. Together we can create a climate safe future and advance economic prosperity for all. Okay, very exciting. It is 10 gigawatts of corporate renewables by 2030. Uh, this is an all Canada goal, an ambitious yet achievable goal. Uh, again, we focus on ambitious and we want it to be grounded in reality with you know pushing uh, the um, pushing us to think to feel to to achieve higher uh, and do more across the country. And there is an analysis behind it. It's not like I woke up one day with a vision of taking up 10 gigawatts. Uh, I will invite Ben Thibault uh, in a moment to um, go through the analysis and the thinking behind this goal. Um, and Ben, if you can please, next slide. Uh, ben is a policy and regulatory expert with uh, over a decade of uh, experience within the electricity and climate and renewable energy uh, policy space. Uh, he is a special advisor for BRC Canada and also served uh, with the government of Alberta back uh, in 2016 uh, in implementing the Climate Leadership Plan, which yesterday was the seven year anniversary for that plan. Uh, so what a moment. Uh, I'll pass this on to you, Ben, to walk us through the goal. Thanks, Najwan. So yeah, um, like Najwan said, I had the honor of helping her and the BRC members and team uh, to set this new target. And to do that, we looked at a, a lot of different materials for the trajectory of new renewable energy development that we need to see across Canada in order to achieve net zero grid in 2035. And the focus was on the emitting grids in the country, recognizing that corporate procurement is most attractive 
where there are grid emissions to displace and, and really a driver for new uh, non-emitting electricity to be used uh, by consumers. So looking at the scale of new projects needed in each of the relevant provinces, and then we right-size the goal to the share of large industrial and commercial electricity consumption in each of the grids. Um, and the result is a nice round 10 gigawatts for 2030, which is a pretty aggressive quintupling of the first goal, um, but it's it's really tuned to what's needed to get to our climate targets and commitments. And it relies on two key linchpins, um, which are linked together. And the first is that the business community is ready to carry their load and make new projects happen through their purchasing power. And we know that business is ready, as demonstrated by the quick uptake that we've seen in the last three years and beating that first goal um, three years early. Um, and you know we know the drivers to source electricity um, renewably and address regulated emissions and scope two emissions and to do it with low cost electricity locked in for the long term has proven really attractive to the business community. So this linchpin is not currently in question, um, though we do need to scale it up and even accelerate. And that brings us to the second linchpin um, and the meat of our discussion today, um, which is that these corporate citizens have the opportunity to support new renew renewable energy through their procurement in the provinces with emitting grids, including outside of Alberta. So that's our discussion today, and that means that for really the first time in a BRC webinar, we are turning our attention away from the biggest blue line on this graph, which represents Alberta's electricity grid emissions, to draw our attention to the other four grids with discernible electricity emissions. And as you can see here, those provinces are Saskatchewan, Ontario, New Brunswick, and Nova Scotia. And when talking about the future of renewable energy procurement in Canada, we need to take a province-by-province -province perspective on those opportunities because... Each province's electricity system is unique. Um, I talk about the provincial grids as snowflakes, not to offend them, but to point out that no two are exactly alike and we really need to look at them um, you know, in turn uniquely. Um, but frankly, the desire by corporate consumers to procure renewable energy arises in any grid with electricity generation emissions. So um, because you know, buyers have and are willing to procure renewable energy certificates from grids like Alberta's for load elsewhere, but there is often a preference for a variety of reasons to get renewable energy close to where their load is, to where they, they consume it. So each of these provinces has the key precondition for attracting those kinds of deals, which is their grid emissions shown as like the darker shaded ones um, on the map here. And so although so far Alberta dominates this market in Canada, because it's the only jurisdiction, like Stephen said, that is open by default to corporate renewable energy procurement, there is considerable buyer interest in the other provinces with emitting grids as well. But in each of these provinces, there's been some barrier in the policy or system design. So whereas Alberta's system um, has that green light off the bat, the other provinces can't really just rely on the status quo to let corporate and institutional procurement pick up the heavy lifting. The barriers in, in, in those previous um, dark blue provinces are similar in that they all have regulated vertically integrated electricity systems with monopoly or exclusive franchise utilities. Um, and though they have their unique elements, of course, um, like Nova Scotia's utility being privatized, that is kind of the main barrier is the fact that they have these um, vertically integrated regulated utility models. Um, and in that sense, the main point here is that the default is that the consumers don't have another option for their electricity. They get it from the one and only utility typically. And so what that means is that not only are renewable energy developers restricted from building and connecting to the system and receiving a power pool rate, um, for their energy they provide, but the consumer is also short on options. Um, and typically it often isn't inherent in the system to have a clear energy rate that buyers can displace by purchasing renewable energy under contract in those systems, as one would find in Alberta through the wholesale hourly pool price for electricity. Um, often in those jurisdictions, you know, the full price is actually all just aggregated into a single price outcome. And so it's not clear how to tease out what you're able to displace by buying through a, a VPPA type contract in that in that jurisdiction. So there's a number of different kind of barriers that don't just enable it sort of as a default or a, a matter of course. Um, but meanwhile, um, you know, it, it, 
but there, the, the, the key kind of message I want to get across here is the last bullet here, which is in each of them, there are solutions. And, uh, and, and that includes with respect to Ontario, which has its own kind of separate and unique set of, of circumstances um, that we'll get to. Um, but, but again, um, that last bullet point applies to everybody, which is that there, there are solutions. So that brings us, the solution side of what we're talking about here brings us to the discussion today. And I get to introduce some really exciting panelists with unique and leaning perspectives on how to do this in these provinces outside of Alberta. So first we'll, we'll hear from, we, we have Maxime Saint-Denis to, to give some of the perspective and experiences from the federal government's role as an electricity buyer that is working to clean its electricity supply across Canada. And Max is the perfect guy for that. Um, having worked as an energy specialist with the federal government for over two decades and working with the team responsible for securing clean energy for the federal government. Um, and then we get to hear next from Leanne Thurber with Nova Scotia's Department of Natural Resources and Renewables, where she is leading the development of the province's Green Choice Program, which means that she has direct and the lead hand in making Nova Scotia the, you know, the leader um, among the provinces for enabling uh, corporate institutions to purchase offsite renewable energy outside of Alberta um, and within a, a vertically integrated uh, utility system, like I mentioned. And then we have Jason Chialoy, um, who is a managing director with Power Advisory and serves a number of other roles, including as the renewable energy generator representative on the on Ontario ISO's technical panel. And for those reasons, as well as every conversation I've ever had with Jason, proves that he is the best guy around to speak to the situation in Ontario, um, where there is now a lively discussion as well about what Ontario can do to get in the game of hosting corporate renewable energy procurement. So with that, um, first, uh, let's let's go to, to Max, which is appropriate because the federal government's clean electricity initiative has done more than really anything else to push the discussion of renewable energy procurement across the country, um, and especially in the provinces with uh, vertically integrated utility systems. So, um, so, you know, great opportunity to start with Max here. So go ahead, take it away, please, Max. Thank you very much, Ben. And um... I'd say Stephen and Ben have covered a lot of the aspects, so I'm going to try to keep it high level to kind of give a perspective to the audience today of some of the work we've done for the federal government and um, uh, won't go into the details in the specific jurisdictions because there's other panelists afterwards that get into the details, but the, during the panel and those discussions, we can kind of give you some of the lessons learned we've had based off this. And, you know, it, we go back to 2019, so I'll stay here just a bit. We go back to, to 2016. And that's when the Pan-Canadian Framework on Clean Growth and Climate Change was developed in partnership with the majority of the provinces and territories and federal government. And that's the first place where the federal government, you know, stated that they would have federal operations in Canada operate on 100% clean electricity. So that is really, that, that is the, you know, that is what's driving this whole initiative. Uh, then the Green Government Strategy, which is really the, the cabinet directive that the, in, drives federal operations as to what they need to do provide a clarification on what needed to be done there. But it was really in 2019, because, you know, it's like uh, 2025 when it's 2016 seems like an eternity away. Uh, and then 2019 came around and it, how do you materialize that uh, ambitious goal with a government that has 21 custodians that have assets in Canada? And we're talking about those custodians under Treasury Board Secretary's responsibility. So it's not all the Crown Corps. We're really focusing on those, what we call Schedule 1, Schedule 2 departments, which uh, TBS has oversight on. And in 2019, and I'm going to go with, that's really where it really came down. So the mandate letter came to our minister at the time, was Minister Anand, and it, it, that's a key piece. Those are the drivers as to what we need to do. And it's really the first indication that set that um, initiative in motion. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch my screen so I can read it exactly to where it is. It's two phrases. They're very important. They're very distinct. So I'm going to go with that. And basically, uh, it states, so PSPC is going to work with provinces and energy suppliers. So work with, develop a strategy to power federal buildings with 100% clean electricity where available by 2022. So you could see they wanted to demonstrate by leadership to help push that file forward across Canada to accelerate it to help. It's hard to be the first one out. And that's sort of that federal government responsibility is to take on that role to really drive those discussions, find out where those opportunities are. And it, opportunities are to allow the people that are interested that maybe don't have the means to be able to follow afterwards and have an easier path. 
so that was the first real piece. For those areas where 2022 wasn't achievable, it, the second phrase is important. Commit to being a first purchaser to help support the growth of new clean electricity, new power sources as they become available. Those phrases set the platform as to what we've been doing since 2019. Okay, and I think now we can we can jump to the next slide. And I only have one slide, and we've we've developed an infographic to help you know set the stage and to talk about it. So we need to understand where we were. This is big. It, it's it's identifying public service procurement Canada to develop a strategy on behalf of government. That's new. Usually each department's responsible. Uh, but we're working very closely with our partners at uh, Treasury Board Secretariat who are responsible for the green government strategy and accounting for greenhouse gas emissions for those operations. So uh, we need to first understand what that scope was. Okay, so if you look at the infographic up here at the top, there, one of those blue bubbles, it's, we already have 80.6% of the electricity we consume for our federal operations across the country considered clean. Hydro, nuclear, wind and solar. Okay, so we're talking about greenhouse gas emission production. So that, there's that 19.4% that comes from high carbon electricity. So it's being produced from coal, uh, natural gas, and oil in some cases. So those are the, so that's the piece we need to figure out. And then we needed to figure out where is it located and, and the strategy. Uh, limited in resources, limited in time, and maybe limited in opportunities. We had to figure out where we were going to focus our efforts to find solutions to, to achieve what we needed to do. So that 19.4, when we actually broke it down, it kind of demonstrated where the strategy needed to go. And I, I mean, Ben mentioned it in his graph there. Uh, if you looked at that bar, bar chart, the four provinces that had the highest emissions, we're looking at intensity, but it also kind of correlates to our operations as well. So Alberta, Saskatchewan, well, Alberta, Nova Scotia, Saskatchewan, and, and New Brunswick. So it was natural to find, try to find local opportunities. So the local was critical for uh, Government of Canada. We wanted to stimulate opportunities, economic and driving that change across the country. We want to spread that wealth. Also understanding that every jurisdiction is unique. We found that out pretty quickly and that not one size fits all. It's actually no size fits all. It's everyone was unique and, and that's how it is and that's okay. Um, and then you get to there and then not just on the way the policy, but it's also on how you work and who the partners you have to work with are. Uh, so some of the key pieces, uh, national coordination. So that's my responsibility. Uh, regional implementation. So we're leveraging our regional teams to drive those files. And I think that's a key piece because they have the, the, the boots on the ground. They understand the market. They understand the players. We want to make sure those relationships are built locally. Um, and with the partnerships, a key piece to this was new infrastructure. We wanted additionality. We wanted to make sure there was no wind and solar. So that was the key pieces. For us, clean is wind and solar. That's where the market was mature to be able to respond to this. That's where our partners were interested in going as well. So this is the, the part of the partnership. Uh, we weren't looking to procure stuff that was already available. We really wanted to drive that change in Canada. And another key piece, and we mentioned it right at the beginning, Najwan did, is uh, we wanted Indigenous participation. Okay. The uh, federal government has also set the uh, commitment for PSBC. That's what my department is that, you know, 5% of our procurement should be driving through Indigenous business or equity contribution or these type of aspects. Well, if we set everything at a minimum 5%, we're not going to succeed at 5%. And if there's a market where we know we can have way above 5%, it is in renewable energy. This is an area I think that the Indigenous community has clearly demonstrated across the country. And uh, it, I don't think it was a surprise, but it was it was pleasant to see the partners across the country, whether it's provincial, crown corporations, private entities, have the exact same objectives. So there was a lot of alignment with the people we needed to work with to find solutions. So that's sort of the piece. So when you look at that, you can see where the distribution is. And I won't go into the details of the individual because Leanne, who I know from Nova Scotia from discussions and with our, our regional people, will talk to the details. Um, you know, for Saskatchewan, I think someone's talking later on also about the Saskatchewan piece as well, and we can come back to that if needed. Uh, and then there's New Brunswick as well. So there's there's those pieces there. Uh, but there's 3.3% that remains out of that 19.4%. That is for the rest of the provinces that are either uh, very hard to find, uh, legislate, provincial legislation is not allowing it today, or the grids are just really clean. And, you know, Stephen mentioned it as some of the pieces we want to get the environmental attribute through a rec. 
And I think a key piece is in Alberta, Saskatchewan, New Brunswick, and Nova Scotia, we're not trying to just displace the dirty portion of the electricity. We want 100% of the electricity we consume from net new. When you looked at the other jurisdictions and where Stephen talked about it is, we're trying to find the displacement portion of it. So that offset, so the the, car, the, um, the carbon offset piece, because to buy the megawatt hours in RECs equivalent for what we need in Quebec, when it's 99% clean, it's just not cost effective for taxpayers. So we're trying to find solutions to really you know, find those opportunities that make best value environmental and financial. So that's really what we're doing. So that's where that National Renewable Energy Certificate Initiative it's an interesting process. I can go into detail a little later, but we, you know, we've been driving through our traditional procurement model at government, open, fair, and transparent. We have to do procurement processes. Uh, what you know, Stephen mentioned about the PPAs and the uh, the VPPAs. Our legislation, our procurement doesn't allow us to use industry standard PPAs, which makes the industry kind of shy and 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 got you know trigger shy to actually do those type of initiatives. Um, so these are things we're learning. Uh, we're also actually going out, we're just looking to secure the environmental attribute because we don't need the electron necessarily because we, we anticipated where the interest would be in Alberta, deregulated market. We have a solution there. So in Alberta, deregulated market, RFP, I think you should anticipate an announcement between uh, for our purposes by the end of this calendar year. That's what we're hoping for. In, in uh, Saskatchewan, uh, we've been working, you know, uh, with our, our I would say colleagues, I'd say energy colleagues at SAS Power. It's been uh, it's been long, but it's been a fantastic journey. It has been very uh, uh, instructional for us, informative, and I think we're landing on something that really makes sense. And I also think someone's going to talk to it, but it might have actually expanded to maybe a service offering to everyone in, in, in Saskatchewan. And that's that's a key piece of that being a first purchase to try to stimulate new, it's not just about new infrastructure, it's maybe new service offerings that didn't exist in the past. Uh, I'm gonna leave it for Leanne. Leanne here, she can talk about Nova Scotia, uh, but that was a piece too, as a first purchaser for us, that was an important piece. So, and in New Brunswick, we're still talking with the uh, uh, New Brunswick power and the province. So everything is a little different. So on that point, I, I'll stop there uh, and leave some time for the other panelists and then looking forward to the questions afterwards. That's great. Thank you so much, Max. That was a great overview to kick us off on just sort of um, what's been under development and how the feds have looked at their role, and not only as a buyer, but as kind of prompting new programs to, that are more generally available and how that's advancing renewable energy across the country. Um, so that, like Max said, takes us to, to now to Leanne, who's going to walk us through um, a pretty comprehensive summary of Nova Scotia's Green Choice pro Program, which gives us so much opportunity to learn because I think it is possible that nobody else in Canada has thought quite as much about the precise design detail of this kind of program that we generally call a green tariff, um, which will enable large consumers to support the development of new renewable energy through their purchasing power, even in a vertically integrated utility system. Um, so over to you, Leanne, I'm hoping you'll you'll scratch uh, our collective itch to nerd out, please. I am excited to nerd out and it is exciting as well to be the, you know, the first, I guess, across Canada to really dive into this from a program design piece. Uh, it is quite an honor and it has been quite the task. Um, so I'm here to speak today. First, we're going to start off with a little bit of introduction about, you know, what does Nova Scotia look like? What is the context and what are the motivators and a little bit about our energy market? And then I'm going to dive more thoroughly into the Green Choice Program design so that folks can get an idea of what it looks like here in Nova Scotia. So for next slide, please. Next one. So here in Nova Scotia, our climate change objectives center are in around reduction of GHGs as it does much across the country. Um, also, we have an uh, underlying factor to consider rural green jobs and growing an inclusive economy. We would like to elevate Nova Scotia leadership. Nova Scotia has actually already met um, the Paris Agreement reduction targets and have gone quite a bit above and beyond some other folks here in across the country in terms of re reducing our current uh, GHG emission reductions, especially from our electricity system, but from many other areas as well. We really are looking to enhance the social equity and reduce poverty. Um, Nova Scotia, by the, unfortunately, has the highest level of energy poverty in the country, and that is something that is very key in our considerations when we think about new programs, especially anything that would impact ratepayers. 
Um, we would also like to build connected, safe, and resilient communities that support healthy populations. So some of what my colleagues do here in my department as well um, can uh, assist with that bullet as well. So what does that mean in terms of targets or goals? So here in Nova Scotia, we have an 80% target for our energy to be supplied by renewable energy by 2030. So currently on our grid, we're just under 40% and the under 40% is unfortunately due to the delay in Muskrat Falls. Um, so essentially we're looking to double that amount of energy uh, by 2030. We are also going to be phasing out our coal facilities by 2030, um, as well as reducing our greenhouse gas emissions overall by 53% below the 20, 2005 levels by 2030 and achieving net zero by 2050. Next slide, please. Uh, I think this might be a restatement. Uh, sure, I can clarify energy poverty just quickly. It just means that a, it depends on the definition that you look, look at. There are different definitions across Canada. Um, it is saying that more than 6% of your salary, for example, uh, would go towards your electricity bill. So that might consider somebody to be in energy poverty. Uh, no, sorry, the previous slide, please. Thank you. Uh, the greenhouse gas emission sources here in Nova Scotia for context for folks to understand where um, why there was quite a large amount of effort going into the electricity system, but I also wanted to note that the other two leading sectors of GHG emissions are from transportation and home heating here in Nova Scotia. So we have lots of programs in my department, specifically in my branch, that are specifically focused at these three emissions uh, sources here in Nova Scotia, and a lot of our policies, programs, regulatory frameworks, all focus on GHG emission reductions in these areas. Next slide. So that brings us lovely into the energy market here in Nova Scotia. And by contrast to Alberta's market, I would say we're almost the exact opposite. Um, so in Nova Scotia, we are a regulated energy market that is uh, largely a monopoly vertically integrated utility. So Nova Scotia Power um, is the monopoly utility that is privatized. It was sold back in 1992. Um, and it is vertically integrated, meaning that it is uh, it owns generation assets as well as the distribution and transmission, as well as the system operations. There are a number of uh, small municipal electric utilities uh, that exist here in the province, but they are uh, represent a small portion of the overall electricity system. Uh, as well, we have a governing body that regulates the utility market and uh, as well as Nova Scotia Power, and that is the Nova Scotia Utility and Review Board. Um, so here at the province level, I deal mostly in climate change legislation, the policy and programs that are largely driven by, uh, by us and, and what is needed for the province, and that sort of uh, overlies in the regulatory market as well as into the utility. So next slide. This is a lot of information, but I'm going to try to sum it up really quickly. It's just a re restatement almost of what I had previously said. So just to make it a little bit clearer, the different roles and responsibilities of the three separate entities here in Nova Scotia. So the government, we often deal in legislation. So the acts, the statutes that govern the electricity system, which would be like the Public Utilities Act or the Electricity Act here in Nova Scotia. So we're responsible for sort of the policy behind that, any legislative amendments, and the regulatory framework that would govern these systems. Um, this is where you would see like the climate change targets, like the 53% reduction, the 2030 targets, all of those are in legislation here in Nova Scotia. And that's where myself or colleagues over at environment and climate change would be involved. As well, we have the regulator, the UARB, which is a direct oversight for the electrical and water utilities here in Nova Scotia. They also sort of enforce the laws. So they would be a judiciary board who has hearings for like uh, rate applications, capital expenditures, the sort of typical um, system operations and other components that you would see from a regulated utility. Um, and Nova Scotia Power is the public is the sorry the private utility here in Nova Scotia. It is shareholder owned. It is a subsidiary of Amira, um, one of several subsidiaries, uh, and it is of course responsible as many utilities are in keeping the lights on and making sure that people have um, you know energy and electricity when they need it in a reliable 
reliable and uh, in a reliable way and provides power and, and generation as well as the transmission and distribution line ownership here. Um, and they are accountable to the shareholders and to their investors as well as their customers. So that's a pretty quick oversight, but uh, or overview, sorry. Um, and I hope I haven't confused anyone too greatly. Next slide, please. Which brings us into the Green Choice Program. So uh, I think I heard someone say earlier that green tariff programs, which is what the Green Choice Program is, is often developed by the utility. And as far as I understand, this Green Choice Program is unique in the sense that it's the government driving this program and not necessarily the utility. Um, they are obviously an active participant in conversations as a very keenly interested um, party in, in the design and the oversight and the administration of this program, but it is the government driving the program itself. Next slide. So how do we get here, essentially? So Maxine kind of alluded to the fact that we uh, they have set some targets from a uh, Canada level, and here in Nova Scotia, this is the mechanism that we have selected to basically meet the federal government's goals of receiving 100% electricity uh, through all of its facilities here in Nova Scotia. And Nova Scotia actually has quite a, a substantial amount of federal facilities here. So it is not an insubstantial amount of energy that's actually needed um, to support their facilities. So overall, in a big picture, of course, there's the climate change goals. This helps us as a province get to our emission reduction goals. It helps us as a province transition the whole system to renewable and helps us get off coal by 2030. So those are some pretty strong climate change motivators. We, as I mentioned, the federal government is a key stakeholder, but in part of that conversation as well, we've also brought in some other large corporations who have expressed interest, as well as other sort of public institutions um, with some pretty ambitious uh, climate change goals, and we wanted to be able to help them meet those goals. Uh, some of the other considerations, of course, is that there are poor alternatives. So the pathway to sort of connect to the grid is pretty, um, it's regulated and it is not, it is pretty limited in terms of the opportunity, it usually goes through a program or a competitive procurement process. We have some other programs that are similar in model, but had limited uptake due to some um, varying pricing within them. So, and then of course there are limited opportunities since our, our electricity mix at this time is still quite carbon intensive. So way back in 2019, we signed an MOU with the federal government that committed us to finding them a pathway, which led us to hire what is now called COHO Climate Advisors to help us design um, a green tariff program here in Nova Scotia, which we call the Green Choice Program. So we established it through legislation back in February of 2020 with some um, overview, sorry, some amendments that were just recently passed in the spring as well, uh, based on our learnings that we, we had took from our engagement sessions. Uh, and that's sort of where we're at as a status update. But at a very high level, it's exactly as already described, you have a participant or a customer already of the utility. In, in this example, we're looking for the larger uh, energy users in the province, so um, and the ability to aggregate, they would ask to participate, new renewable energy would be built to meet their needs and the utility sort of acts as a go between between those two parties to deliver the energy and to purchase it. Uh, next slide, please. This is a busy slide and I do apologize for its busyness and I'm going to do my best to try to put this uh, as simply as I, as I can uh, since I know this really well and sometimes it can get a little bit confusing. So if you are currently a customer of Nova Scotia Power, the utility here in Nova Scotia, you can sign up to this program through the minister who can accept you uh, to receive new renewable energy. The electricity and your participation as a customer with Nova Scotia Power does not change. New renewable energy is built as a supply that flows through to the utility. And then of course the electrons are sent on to the participant that has been registered. Um, as well, you have the existing access that are already on the grid here, um, but some of which are uh, renewable and some are carbon intensive. And how this sort of works is that you continue to pay your electricity bill as is. So the tariff or your rate class that you already pay as set by the utility review board does not change. 
what is added are two separate line items on your bill, which is a cost credit structure that allows you to pay a fee for a participation in the program and also receive a credit, which is a reduction or a discount um, on your bill that is evaluated at the bottom of the line. So the cost that you would be paying as a participant in this program, so a customer, you would pay a fixed monthly administrative fee just to cover the costs of the utility taking on the burden of sort of the fluctuations and the terms and conditions of new customers and, and the oversight of those things, as well as there is a potential for an additional fee, which you're calling a green choice fee. The credit on the other side is actually the exemption from any direct carbon compliance on the system. So carbon tax, Currently, we have a cap and trade system here in Nova Scotia. That is the sort of the discount or the exemption. So that would be the credit that would show up on your bill. Subscribers are, can enroll for a percentage of the total of their energy up to 120% of the total based on their last year's supply to anticipate any growth electrification that might happen over the term of the contract. I know that was a lot. If anyone has any questions after we're done that, that's totally fine, we can come back to it, but I am gonna keep moving on it. I completely understand this is a lot of information to try to digest in a short amount of time. At a really high level, how this process works is that uh, the participant would submit an expression of interest. So how much energy do you need? When do you need it by? And do you have sort of a public um, facing commitment? to climate change goals or emission reduction goals. So that will help us guide to understand you know, who needs it by when. The minister will enroll you into the program and then uh, a procurement exercise, which is a competitive procurement process happens that seeks to build and supply the new renewable energy as well through an RFP or request for proposals. And then as well, the application process would have formally um, bring in the participants and, and kind of get them signed on the dotted line. The governing documents that sort of uh, keep everybody contractually obliged to what's happening here is a power purchase agreement for the supplier, which is obviously really common, as well as the participant uh, terms and conditions. So that would be sort of integrated into the customer's terms and conditions that would, they would already have established with just some additional information for those specific to this program. Who can participate? So as I mentioned, we this conversation started with a public institution with the federal government, but we've actually since expanded it to include any public institution. So a charity, a school authority, a college, a university, a hospital authority, provincial, federal, municipal government, crowns, agencies, departments, or any Mi'kmaq band, which is our uh, First Nation band here in Nova Scotia, any of its council or wholly owned subsidiary. On the other side, we also have a single, a single corporate customer or uh, a corporate customer with multiple accounts here in Nova Scotia. As I mentioned, this is meant for large energy users. So we are looking for folks who are at least 10,000 megawatt hours per year and above who are eligible to enroll up to 120% of their energy load. There's also an aggregate partnership opportunity where each partner in the partnership has to have a minimum subscription of 2,000 megawatt hours per year to collectively get you at least to that 10,000 megawatt hour load, but it obviously can go above and beyond. And that aggregate partnership is only eligible for separate public institutions. So if I am the government of Canada, for example, you are one public institution versus if I wanted to be a municipality, the hospital, the port, school authority, the college and the university in that town, like those are different public institutions that would be eligible to aggregate. As I mentioned, there would be sort of an expanded terms and conditions as a customer uh, with the utility and the cost and credit system. So the bill would show up, it would show up on your electricity bill as it currently is, as additional line items. Suppliers are independent power producers um, and they would be selected through a competitive request for proposals process conducted by an independent procurement administrator. So as I mentioned earlier, we have been working with COHO Climate Advisors to develop the Green Choice Program. At the same time, we contracted them to uh, administer our most recent and wildly successful, I do say, my, say so myself, um, uh, procurement for all customers in Nova Scotia. So we are just coming off the tail end of that successful procurement and looking to, to do this again with um, 
A PPA basically goes to the UARB for the review and approval. We just updated it for the first time in about a decade. So thankfully we have a more up-to-date, more modern uh, power purchase agreement by which we can pull from for this next round. It's a standard form that applies across the board. There is some small wiggle room for a little bit of negotiation on the other side, but it is really limited. Um, the suppliers, of course, sell the electricity to Nova Scotia Power through the grid. Um, and then the attributes of the, of the project flow through to the utility, which flows through to the participant. So you do get the rec or the title to the renewable attribute as a participant that allows you to you know, meet your carbon, um, uh, carbon goals or uh, carbon emission reduction goals through any sort of uh, carbon accounting system. Huh. So the cost and the credits. So the PPA prices in this instance actually support all customers. So the direct transfer of the PPA price isn't going specifically to participants, but actually go to support, support everyone, um, all the rate payers here in Nova Scotia. The addition of those new renewable energy assets allows the province to achieve our renewable energy targets. It reduces the upward cost pressures on all rate payers for fossil fuel assets um, and any sort of taxes uh, as a result of carbon compliance. But it does allow for the renewable energy certificates to be flowed through to the participant. Um, the utility would sort of register through one of those formalized, um, recognized like uh, green E or eco logo uh, certificate programs, and it would be registered in the participant's name and then also retired on behalf of the participant. So it would not be available for further market transaction. Participants, as I mentioned, they would pay sort of an additional administrative fee that would cover the cost um, of the utility to administer and sort of provide oversight to this program, as well as the credit is the exemption on any compliance, any direct compliance with any carbon taxes in the amount that you have enrolled in the program. That's the caveat. So of course, if you have enrolled 100% of your energy, you are exempt from 100% of the direct costs for carbon compliance in Nova Scotia. Next slide. I also want to take the time since I have everyone here and I have a captive audience um, to just mention a few of the other programs that we have on the go here in Nova Scotia. One thing that is new to us actually and is currently under design is a sleeve PPA and a backstop PPA. Um, there are several larger uh, customers here in Nova Scotia that are interested in building their own sort of renewable energy assets to support their own um, renewal, uh, achievement of their own sort of carbon emission reduction targets. Uh, and as a result, of course, to, to get those projects financed, they need a wonderful backstop or a sleep PPA to enable them to do that. So we're currently in talks and trying to figure out how we sort of set the policy and the program around that to do that. Um, one of the key caveats or one of the key things to say is that you know, this is a pretty limited opportunity, so I don't want to get too many people's hopes up. Um, but it is where like the, there would be a mutual benefit. So it would provide additional benefits to the rate payers of Nova Scotia, but would also assist the business in the longevity of their, their time here in Nova Scotia, as well as helping them, of course, to meet their own um, targets around climate change. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is the, the last one. I just wanted to give a shout out to some of the other programs that we do here in Nova Scotia. Uh, there actually is no regulatory limits in and around building behind the meter. So if you wanted to build a renewable energy project that directly connected to the facility, but did not connect to the electricity grid, you can do that. Obviously you're not gonna overbuild to the point where you know, you're know you losing or you're, um, you're not using all that energy. The There is processes by which of course with the utility and the utility and review board that of course you would have to still go through as an interconnection process. But from a regulatory perspective, i.e. in statutes or legislation, there are no limits there. We have net metering, which predominantly in Nova Scotia is around solar. We have 27 kilowatts for residential customers, which is actually an as of right, i.e. there is no oversight. You can build it, you can put it up, and that is sort of the process for any residential customer in Nova Scotia. For customers outside of the residential rate class, um, they can build up to 200 kilowatts. And for anyone in Nova Scotia who has a demand charge, on their utility bill, as well as our agriculture and um, aquaculture industries, they can build up to one megawatt. We have a community solar program uh, in design, which we're hoping to have up and running by next year. So uh, we like to tagline it as uh, Netflix for solar, where subscribers can sign up and receive the same benefits as if you had hooked up solar. 
We have, as I mentioned, the Renewable to Retail Program, which is actually administered by the utility with oversight by the Utility Review Board. And we have one current operator who is licensed to be a supplier under the Renewable to Retail Program. And we're in the process of trying to figure out uh, how best to uh, bring in some of those key um, capacity elements that will help us in, our, uh, in the process by which we need to get to our goals of 80% by 2030 through exploring opportunities for battery storage and renewable capacity and some ancillary services that renewable assets, for example, can provide to the grid as well. I think that's it from me. So that was a lot of information I just threw at everyone. I am absolutely interested in hearing people's uh, questions and happy to answer them. Thank you so much, Leanne. Um, I'm gonna throw a curveball at Calvin. And the reason is because um, Leanne's presentation um, pointing to the opportunity for a potential sleeve deal program development in Nova Scotia is really interesting and actually links into what I want to say quickly about Saskatchewan to then enable to make sure that we have enough time for for Jason to be able to say um, to cover Ontario to the extent that Jason wants to. So I'm going to just flip forward, Calvin, to the Saskatchewan slide. Um, I don't need to spend a whole lot of time here um, because um, you know, there isn't a lot that's public about what Saskatchewan is proceeding with and um, what we, you know, what we ha have come to, to hear because um, there has been discussions with some customers um, leads us to know that it's also largely a subscription um, type program and so has, you know, elements that are of some similarity with what Leanne mentioned around the Green Choice program. Um, and we know that SAS Power has uh, you know, discuss this the the idea of this opportunity with some consumers, um, and uh, and probably the most public element of what it has proceeded with is the procurement of the renewable energy itself. It's necessary for a first round of the program, as SES Power has gone out to tender on a hundred megawatt solar procurement for a project to be built on SES Power land. Um, it is understood that it is intended to serve this renewable program. Um, that there are some important limitations within the first um, the first element, particularly the 100 megawatts um, being, you know, really just a first step um, as it's, it's, you know, relative to the full amount of interest in this program that there is among industry. It's, it's really just like a fraction of that. So um, there will be, you know, I think further consideration to go forward. Um, but this goes in part to a particular element of Saskatchewan that differentiates it from Nova Scotia and appears a bit more like Alberta, which is the very large industrial consumer presence in, in the province that um, is kind of driving requests for for the opportunity to purchase renewable energy and different consumer types lend themselves to different program designs. So there is actually an opportunity in Saskatchewan to enable opportunities that are more geared toward capitalizing on the particular uh, type of kind of risk and initiative that a large industrial consumer can take on. So that takes me to the next slide, um, which, you know, just to say that fortunately these types of programs exist because so many U.S. jurisdictions with vertically integrated electricity markets have realized the importance of the opportunity to host renewable energy procurement to serve customer needs. So they have instituted green tariff programs. Um, and like Leon said, that has typically been utilities, but it can also be governments. Utilities realize often that although the deals might detract from their monopolies, they have a vested interest in maintaining and growing corporate consumers to add to their rate base. So, um, so they often actually, you know, hear from their consumers the expectation of allowing this and take the lead in developing a program. But the point is of this slide is just to point out that our southern neighbor has solved a lot of these problems many times over through a variety of, of policy and program innovations that enable these types of procurements in different systems and different types of systems, regulated systems, they just have so many different states and, and, and grids, it's, it's kind of a more dynamic um, policy lab down there. And that leads me to the next slide, um, which just to point out that the difference in those programs can kind of fall along a spectrum between two paradigms on either side. One is the pure subscription green tariff where a central authority like utility um, or a procurement authority like was chosen in Nova Scotia undertakes the renewable energy procurement and customers are invited to sign up for a tranche of that re renewable energy. And this works 
really great for smaller customers like smaller commercial buyers and institutions like post-secondary institutes and local governments who don't have the wherewithal or scale to undertake their own cost-effective procurements. Um, and this is set off against a different type of green tariff sleeve deal where a large buyer can participate directly in choosing its own renewable energy project, then work with both that project and the utility to handle the electric energy and environmental attributes while working with the utility to design a fair tariff to recognize the energy value of the renewable energy to make sure that it's a win-win like Leanne spoke to, that there's also a win for the rate base um, through this procurement as well. And that the buyer of the renewable energy is kind of, you know, still getting their fair treatment uh, uh, under the tariff design. And so this latter one places more emphasis on the specific preferences and role of the customer. Um, so Leanne showed in Nova Scotia how a subscription model can aggregate and take account of customer preferences through a co comprehensive and really well-designed designed stakeholder engagement process. So even the subscription model can make sure that customers' viewpoints are brought in, but they're really aggregated for many different customers because that's what's in mind with a subscription model. Um, but yeah, it, but because, and because some customers just don't have the electricity demand to be able to make it work economically to do uh, a, a deal on their own and get a tariff um, through the utility on their own. The aggregation really makes sense for certain types of customers, um, but in situations where there's very large industrial consumers, which we know exist in Saskatchewan, who are very interested in renewable energy development, um, and like Leon spoke, mentioned, also exist uh, in Nova Scotia, there's an opportunity to do um, the more sleeve deal oriented purchasing as well. And this is a bit of your sort of, I guess, 101 framework uh, of an academic class on what green tariffs can look like. And of course, they can fall in between these two elements along the spectrum uh, as well. And it, that just goes down to the peculiar design details. So that kind of covers off the the provinces that we wanted to speak to related to um, how to overcome these barriers that come about with vertically integrated um, utilities with exclusive franchise. Um, but now I'm going to invite uh, Jason to to pop up um, and take over the the somewhat daunting task of giving us a little bit of overview of of what he wants to talk about related to developing these opportunities uh, in the Ontario situation. Thanks, Ben, and um, thanks BRC for inviting me once again to speak. I really enjoyed listening to the other speakers, and as a professional in the sector, I've certainly noticed. Um, there's many different ways to skin a cat, and certainly there's different markets across Canada, and I wholeheartedly support there's no reason why all jurisdictions within some priority should have optionality for customers to purchase non-emitting attributes and the electricity that goes with it, as well as um, many different entities developing projects and maintaining the projects producing that non-emitting energy. So. I don't have any slides because frankly, things are still in the early stages, but they're moving in Ontario. And before I get to uh, my very brief delivery, I just wanna set some context. So I think number one, the thing about Ontario is it's um, a pretty dynamic electricity market to say the least, because it's a hodgepodge of a bunch of different things. We do have a wholesale market like Alberta. So there is hourly pricing to which customers can hedge. Um, we have a very diverse supply mix. Um, we do have some emitting um, the resources on the system. And right now there's a lot of discussion in Ontario about what to do about the gas fire generation. We shut down the coal fire generation um, some years ago. And the other thing I would say about Ontario, um, there's a huge diversity of prospective buyers for um, clean energy certificates, renewable uh, energy certificates, and, and power in general. Um, uh, to put it in context, Ontario's demand is well over twice the size of Alberta. And then customers comprising that demand are from different sectors, um, automotive, mining, agriculture, uh, tech, um, municipalities, all, all of the different buckets of buyers that you see that have transacted renewable energy corporate PPAs in Alberta, as well as across the US and the globe. So Ontario, we're fortunate to be a hub of many different companies from many different industries. 
So it'll play to some of the points that I want to raise. So my first area of delivery or discussion are really just the drivers of what um, are going to, I think, set the context for increasing discussion, how to unlock corporate PPAs in Ontario. And the first driver really is the supply need. We've had a lot of supply built in the province, but a lot of it is going to retire, mostly nuclear generation. Some of the nuclear generation is also being refurbished. Those are really big units that are going to come offline, and we can't rely on that supply. But the biggest driver for the supply needs going forward are the increase in demand. So think about some of the sectors that I just mentioned, agricultural and mining and things like that. Um, as they electrify, that's what's driving a lot of the demand in the province is electrification uh, driven by those customers, as I just mentioned, whether it be through their corporate policies um, to, to um, move towards electrification, um, but for also other reasons. Um, so to put in context in terms of numbers, by the beginning of the next decade, Ontario requires something of the magnitude of 10,000 megawatts of generation. So some of that can come from repowered facilities. So think about a wind or solar generation uh, facility that's going to retire uh, potentially what, given the expiry of its contract held with the system operator, there's opportunities to repower that. But in, in addition to the repowering opportunities, there's greenfield development opportunities simply because again, the demand is increasing so much in Ontario. Um, a second driver, and many of the speakers have talked about this, it, it's the strong decarbonization policies of not just the federal government. Um, in Ontario, even with a, um, a, a right-leaning conservative government, I would argue they've changed around their tune quite a bit since taking power into 2018 through to now um, in terms of um, environmental and climate goals. What's also happening in Ontario at the ground level, there's lots of municipalities um, well over 50, 60 of them that have adopted climate action plans and uh, renewable energy plans. So all levels of government are looking to decarbonize. And then the third driver being back to the point, all the different types of customers in, in the market. And a couple of the speakers have mentioned customers with um, environmental, social and governance ESG uh, goals. And as well mentioned that from the top. So um, we're starting to see those customers get more vocal. So moving to um, the second area that I want to discuss, really, Ontario is now getting set to enable this stuff. There's a lot of discussions happening in the industry. There's lots of discussions happening directly with government. So one example of an enabler is the Ontario government, I think next year, are going to launch what they're going to call a clean energy credit or CEC registry. And that, that's the Ontario pseudonym for a renewable energy certificate or a REC. And one easy way to um, validate what the environmental attribute is, is to have a system that's tracking the electrons that can validate the source of the electrons and that they're non-emitting and they're, they're clean. And, and the best example I can give about how Ontario is moving forward, Microsoft, who's done lots of corporate PPAs globally, um, and they've done, uh, they've this year announced corporate PPAs in Alberta. They've also done a deal in Ontario with Ontario's biggest generator, uh, Ontario Power Generation, which is owned and operated by the Ontario government. The deal isn't a classic corporate PPA, um, but nonetheless, it is a 10 year agreement um, to ensure that Microsoft will be consuming um, energy from non emitting resources. So it, it's a take on a power purchase agreement, but nonetheless, it is a power purchase agreement, not just not in the sense of what we've been talking about. I take that as a very positive development because if you had asked me and others that follow Ontario closely, um, not even five years ago, two years ago, that would such a deal happen in Ontario, we'd probably say, nah, not, not really, but, but good on Microsoft, good on OPG, and because OPG is owned by the government, good on the government for getting comfortable with that sort of deal. So I, I think that that starts to open um, the creativity and um, open-mindedness to what could happen in Ontario. I think the other thing about um, Ontario, back to some of the fundamentals, but this will be an enabler. I said earlier that we are moving away from a situation of lots of supply. I also said we have a wholesale market. So the wholesale hourly prices for energy have been really low. 
So that's not really a good economic driver to hedge when you've got cheap energy on the wholesale spot market. Now, I'm, I'm not talking about the total cost and whether that's cheap or not. I'm just talking about um, the price uh, in, in the power pool or the spot market in Ontario. Um, I also said that we need lots of supply. So that's going to mean that the wholesale price on the hourly spot market is going to increase quite a lot. And our, our projections are showing um, in the next five years, well over $80 a megawatt hour, which starts to make corporate PPAs for cleaner renewable energy more economic. And it starts to get around some of the barriers to some of the charges in, in the market. So I think that's going to be an enabler. And, and talking to a bunch of industrial customers in Ontario, they're getting more and more concerned about where the spot price for energy may go. So they're going to want to exercise tools to hedge that and, and corporate PPAs or other forms of that type of contract really can, can help. So, so you've got a lot of drivers with a bunch of enablers starting to really manifest themselves in the province. So the last area I want to talk about, and um, not trying to steal Najwan's thunder this way, or even my colleagues um, at Canria, I sit on the board there, the Canadian Renewable Energy Association, but it's the bucket of actions. There's a bunch of things happening now that didn't happen even seven months ago. So through BRC Canada, there's a movement to organize buyers that are active in Ontario um, that have real, real uh, drivers to enter into contracts for clean or renewable energy. And as I said, with all of those different types of customers, all of those different types of industries, it's, um, it's nice to see them come together and look towards working together to push the Ontario government to unlock corporate PPAs. And, and this initiative, um, as you might expect, um, involves customers from the technology side, uh, industrial side, including autos. So, so in Ontario, again, uh, manufacturing and, and that type of load is really, really important, um, at least politically for um, the type of conservative government we have and the types of jobs that those um, manufacturing companies bring to the market. So if you can incorporate renewable or clean energy with that, um, that makes a lot of sense. And then on the Canria side, um, they've been engaged for a while with the Ontario government and the Ministry of Energy. And they're in the process of putting together a corporate PPA pilot program, which was requested by the Ministry of Energy through the chief of staff to the minister. So they're going to be speaking to the government, uh, I believe it's next week about this. So I would keep looking to Ontario as um, this sort of sleeping giant that I think is awake now. And the sleeping giant might start to walk around next year in 2023. And um, I think with continued coordination, given the drivers, the enablers, and the actions that I just spoke about, Ontario could be a pretty interesting place starting next year. So to that, I'll turn it back over to Ben, and I look forward to your questions. Thanks, Jason. Um, in uh, you know, a, a pretty strong exposition of poor moderation, uh, I think we've largely run ourselves pretty close to out of time. Um, but I would invite like all of our speakers to just come back on camera. I, I think there's a desire to put kind of show us so that we can have a quick conversation. Um, and I, I wanted to invite Max back in just, you know, Max kicked us off by explaining some of the federal government's objective that has driven some of this development in the different provinces. And I'm curious for Mac to, Max, for your take on sort of what you've heard. And, and I mean, I think not necessarily all of this was new to you, but curious if you want to just kind of speak to how it's going and how you feel like this development um, is looking and, and uh, if there's some kind of wrap up elements for, for you in terms of what you've heard. Now, no, I think the what we've seen is, is a different pace, but I think every jurisdiction is open. We've had phone calls from Manitoba. We've had I had a phone call, I had a conversation with people from Hydro Quebec, from Quebec. Like even the clean markets are looking for opportunities. We've had uh, mostly through Treasury Board, but discussions with the IASO in Ontario because you know of that three point three percent left for Rex, eighty percent of that is. Federal operations in Ontario, have, it's a clean market, but it's still in terms of what remains, it's an Ontario, we'd like to find a local solution in Ontario. The last four years, I think Jason's 
I feel comfortable at the end of this one. There hasn't been anything there to meet what we've asked for. Remember, we, we're looking for new. There's, we have a, um, a higher threshold of standards, I think, that we're looking to achieve, uh, that we're, we've set as very high ambitious, but I can see opportunities moving forward. So just because we, uh, we deliver a REC initiative, that is why I, we call that sort of that stop gap to meet that uh, acceleration. If there's a local opportunity that materializes later, I think we still have as part of the mandate that obligation to explore it as an opportunity to help. And I'm not saying we're not the catalyst. We're just trying to help accelerate things because these things are going to get to where they need to. We're just trying to support an acceleration. So with Leanne in Nova Scotia, I think the signing of the MOU, because Nova Scotia tried to do it previously. It just, it, it just was, we put a new set of tires on the thing. That's all we did. It had a little more traction and then it, it went going. And then, and then Nova Scotia brought all the other partners, but it's because there was a, not just us, there's other people that want to, I'll say it, like Nova Scotia is a great example. Our need is for about 60 megawatts. Okay. The green choice was set aside because of the rate based, because the business case demonstrated is good value for Nova Scotia. So there's a, there's a megawatt there, but I think the total potential right now for those two initiatives is 600 megawatts. We're not the catalyst for 600. We're maybe the catalyst to accelerate that. And that we're proud of. It, it took many years. In Saskatchewan, it took many years. It doesn't matter how long it takes. This is a long-term objective. So when Ontario is ready, we'll go there as well. And it just makes sense. And we're talking to Manitoba and, and, and Quebec. Manitoba is looking to free up some capacity because they, they export energy. So at the end of the day, it's, yeah, maybe there's an opportunity in Manitoba or Quebec, but the net result is, is that there's a coal plant somewhere else in the United States that's shut down. You know, that's that's the whole aspect that we're trying to find solutions that are just the ultimate accountant's mother nature. And I'll, I'll, never, I'll always stop. She is the ultimate accountant. And that's what we need to look at. So we can't just automatically discard something just because it looks like it's a clean grid. What is the net result of that action uh, in the eyes of mother nature? And I think that's how I like to stop that conversation because the boundaries are complex. But at the end of the day, if we always step back and say, what does mother nature see? I think that's that's the driver for that. Do I take a look? deeper in that so excited with Ontario excited to continue with Nova Scotia excited with what's going on in Saskatchewan excited in Alberta you know so and excited to see all this work being done and, and the sharing of what's going on with other people in Canada because we're not the only ones looking for this thanks Max I think yeah, yeah that speaks to kind of the buyer's interest in looking local and for the federal government to want it. But I know that that comes up for, for corporate um, procurement as well, looking to, to procure close to where their, their operations are often. Jason, there is one quick question in the chat related to um, how, you know, how much we can expect the new supply to come in through the, the market price rather than through sort of out of market procurement that would end up in the, the global adjustment instead. I don't know if you have any thoughts on, on that. Yeah, I do. So yeah, Ontario does need a lot of supply. Um, one thing that's going to happen, which hasn't been happening over the last several years, again, through the wholesale market, gas fired generation, if we don't change things around, just bear with me for a second, is forecast right now to run more than it has been over the last several years. And the cost of natural gas, whether it be the actual input fuel or the carbon tax or the provincial emission performance uh, standard, all of that is going to increase the, the marginal cost of gas, which is going to increase the wholesale price of energy. And I'll, I'll skip through this really fast now. When you do all the math, when you figure out, well, what can be developed and what that cost is on balance, the wholesale energy price is going to be bigger than the global adjustment. So my point to that is customers will then react and it'll start mm -hmm. with the industrial customers. Cool, virtuous cycle eventually here, maybe. Um, well, thank you. Thanks everybody. And my apologies to anybody who did want to ask more questions. It just shows how much interest there is in this topic and how much there is to talk about in these other jurisdictions. Um, but thank you so much, everybody. I'll pass it to Najwan to, to close up. Yeah, this was amazing. And congratulations, Nova Scotia. Like this is the farthest design I've ever seen. It's so exciting to see that. Uh, I can't wait to see what happens in Ontario and Saskatchewan down the road. Quickly for those uh, with us, uh, upcoming events, we have a public event in the New Year's where we will 
do a reflection on 20 in, on this year 2022 and we'll talk about ESG trends that we're seeing and then we have uh, a buyers only event on risk management in PPAs and then in April we have a boot camp and uh, a member forum uh, so the buyers boot camp is a two day intensive uh, course for everyone uh, for the buyers who are interested to start their clean uh, energy procurement and then, of course, we have our happy hour uh, in Stampede for all our members. Uh, so please keep checking our website for all the events. And thank you all for attending. And special thanks to our event sponsors, EDF Renewables and Res Group, uh, for supporting all our events this year. Uh, thank you for joining us. And thank you for all the speakers. I've learned so much. And I can't wait, can, can't wait to see what's next in all the provinces. It's very exciting. So follow us, uh, keep looking, and let's get this 10 gigawatts done by 2030. Have a good day.